Welcome to the new podcast, In the Garden with Susan. I'm your host, Susan Ladner. I will aim to bring you top quality information on how to save open pollinated seeds, grow a garden, and preserve what you grow. Every Wednesday, I'll be sharing practical tips and techniques to help you on your journey to food security. Join me as I preserve the abundance of produce that my garden provides. Learn new ways of putting food away for the winter and some old ways that are from another century. You can find this podcast on Shopify and at my website. Come on, let's go wander down to the garden and awaken the dreams, history, and love that is held inside every seed. Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of In the Garden with Susan and I it, today is Sunday and I know that this was supposed to come out on Wednesday however on Thursday I thought it was Wednesday and then we've been in such a massive heat wave that I'm getting up really early in the morning to hand water the garden and of course I can't hand water at all. Like I do little sections at a time and some of the things I've been trying to do every day, like there's, I'm really trying to get my cucumbers growing. Um, There there was a lot of problems at the start of the year with the cucumbers, the melons, like things just were not doing well. And so I started more and just before this heat wave came in, I put some of the transplants in. And so they, I'm really trying to keep them alive because I'll go out there and they just look like they're almost dead. And some of the greens, you know, the greens are doing pretty good, but I am watering them every day. And there are three areas in the garden that are for dry farming. And I'm telling you right now, I love dry farming. Uh, it's the way to go. I know everything can't be dry farmed, but those areas are doing so well. They've never had any water. I, the zucchini patch, I never watered the zucchini ever. I put the seeds in the ground and that's it. And same with some of the tomatoes. I have a, a dirty girl patch and some of the tomatoes, I had planted 12 of them. Um, only five have survived. I think in part the, uh, the goats got in the garden three times and the one time they were in the garden, they either got trampled down or some of them got eaten. But anyway, the, the dirty girls are doing really well. And so are the Anarita. They are in another section and they, the Anaritas were started by seed, uh, inside and they did get water when they were babies and so I was a little worried about them because they went from getting water all the time and I just transplanted them out and I just put water in the hole and that was it and they look fabulous even in this heat whereas some of my other tomatoes that have been being watered and you know just not normal gardening where you water I don't water them all the time but they're not looking very good. Some of them. And, you know, I, I'm, I can't water all of them. I can't water the whole garden. Um, and so a lot of things are just there. It's doing well. I must say the gardens is really looking good, but that's what I've been doing. I like, I'm trying to figure out what needs water sometimes. And I'll go into one area and be like, Oh my gosh, these guys are, these guys are going down. And so I'll water them. But something I just, and I'm going way off topic, I know this is flower power, but I just wanted to mention this. Um, The Seed Savers Exchange has their annual conference. And so yesterday I was listening to one of the speakers talk, and this was the most, and it was so timely, this information, because I have been feeling a bit of stress. We have no rain in the forecast we're in, like it looks like there's an ongoing heat wave for who knows how long. Um, I'm getting so tired, and you know this walking to the, you know even though like there's a big swimming pool of water, walking to the swimming pool, filling up the water jug, yanking it out of the pool, walking back into the garden. It you know it's getting a little old, and so I've really cut back on what I 
I'm watering out there and and I've been wondering, am I doing some damage? Like, you know, I, at least I just only have to get stuff to seed, but I really want plants to do well. And so this, this woman that was talking, she was talking about the stress that plants undergo when they have either stress from lack of water or stress from insects any sort of stress. And she even talked about how some people put shade cloth on their tomatoes and, you know, that that's really not doing anything. Like we do want our plants to experience some stress because it raises the antioxidants. It like the nutrients of that plant and what it can provide us go way up. And just like the whole, um, I have to listen to it again because I was doing things, but what I took away is like the plant becomes stronger and the fruit and seeds that that plant gives us after enduring such stress are so much more beneficial for us. So it totally took me like from worrying about my garden to celebrating that, you know, my plants and seeds are going to be like very strong and, and um, some of the antioxidants and the nutrition that they're going to be giving me from this stress. And even when you have like uh, seeds or sorry, uh, plants that have leaves or something that are insect damaged or that the insects have eaten some of the leaves, those leaves are so good to eat because they have a higher, they're, they're more uh, beneficial nutritionally to you and what it can provide um, because it's just been amped up. And so I'm sure there are terms I'm not really including that I, I should I should be able to explain it better. Um, but maybe I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it. And I'd even like to do a blog post or maybe even a podcast about this because it it's so interesting and it's something I never, ever really thought about, you know, um, and especially with the dry farming. Like that, I know that the dry farming it's going to be more nutri or more flavorful, uh, but I never really thought about how it's more beneficial with the antioxidants and and you know the anti well we can't I don't know if I can say that word but the c word um, it really helps to keep that at bay. But anyway, I'm just going off on a sidetrack. That's a little about, bit about what's going on in my life. <laughs> I, I don't know if you wanted to know or not. Um, but I've got a hodgepodge of flowers to talk about today. And it's just kind of a myth, mix matched. I went through my list and some of them, like I just picked out some ones. They don't really go together. Um, I sort of like to keep some things as a theme. But I'm really, I'm, it's really hot today. And um, I just was like, I, these are some of the things that interested me from the list. And so the first one is the Jerusalem artichoke flower. And I have nine varieties of Jerusalem artichokes growing in my garden. And none of them have flowered yet. But the one is, I would say it's seven feet. And then the one area um, I, it's like a forest of Jerusalem artichokes. Um, it's, they're, they're doing really well and none of them have been watered. So, but of course, like they can, it's, they can handle a lot. They, they don't need a lot of water. Um, so anyway, uh, the, this, this, the sun choke, it's, um, it's related to the sunflower and it has yellow flowers that resemble small sunflowers. And so the, the flowers of the sunchoke are edible and they're not commonly consumed. However, the petals can be eaten raw or cooked and they have a mild, slightly sweet flavor. And so Jerusalem artichoke flowers can be used several ways in the kitchen. They can be used as garnishes and you can use the bright yellow petals um, in salads, soups, or other dishes to add a splash of color. You can throw the petals into salads for a bit of extra flavor and visual appeal. And, um, and so, but basically they are edible decor and you can use them for many different decorations in your different culinary pre pre presentations. <clears throat> and so, 
to preserve the Jerusalem artichoke flower, you can dry them. And after they can be then used in teas or as a garnish. And you can, even though it's not common to freeze these petals, you could put them frozen in ice cubes to add visual interest to drinks. And so things, some recipes that you can use with the Jerusalem artichokes is the Jerusalem artichoke flower tea. And you just steep dry or fresh petals in hot water to make a mild herbal tea. And then you can throw them in your salad. Those are only the, really the recipes I could find. And so there's lots of different varieties of the Jerusalem artichokes. And they all vary in size and color of tubers. But the flowers generally do not vary very much in flavor and they all tend to have a gentle slightly sweet taste and so for harvesting them you want to collect the flowers when they are fully open and vibrant for the best aesthetic appeal and taste and of course as always you want to make sure the plants you're harvesting from have not been treated with pesticides or chemicals and so the next flower is the gladiolus. And these are known for their dramatic spikes of colorful flowers. And they're primarily grown for ornamental purposes. <clears throat> However, their flowers are also edible and can offer a surprising element in culinary preparations. And so the flowers of the gladiolus plant are edible with a slightly sweet taste and a texture that can be a bit crunchy and they should be eaten in moderation as the bulbs of the plant are not edible and can be toxic. And so gladiolus flowers are used in garnishes and they're perfect for garnishing or decorating plates. Um, or cakes <laughs> and the salads you can put individual petals sprinkled over salads for a splash of color and a mild lettuce like flavor and you can also infuse the petals into syrups vinegars or waters and they add a floral note to beverages and dressings and to preserve them uh, the petals can be frozen in ice cubes, and of course you can dry them. Um, though they're not commonly dried for culinary use due to their mild flavor, uh, they might not they might not dry very well. So probably I don't recommend that. <clears throat> and you can also candy them. And so some of the recipes I found is gladiolus petal sorbet. And you infuse a simple syrup with gladiolus petals, strain, then mix with lemon juice, and freeze to make a refresh, refreshing sorbet. And then for your salad, you just add the gladiolus petals to a mixed green salad for extra color and uh, decorating cakes. You can use fresh or candied gladiolus petals to decorate cakes and cupcakes and this adds some elegance and colors and so there are numerous varieties of gladiolus and they each have a unique color and size and so the flavor differences between these varieties are generally subtle with most having a neutral to slightly sweet taste and the main variation is in their appearance, which can range from vibrant reds and pinks to yellows, purples, and even multicolored patterns. And so, yeah, that's something interesting. I wish I had some gladiolus growing. I'm, I'm going to have to look for that. And this next one is something I keep looking at. Um, I have these growing right along the fence that's near my swimming pool. And so it's the, it's the scarlet runner bean. And although the variety I have growing is the black knight, um, this, I, it, the, this is 
pertains to like all runner beans are edible. Well, we'll sort of get into that. But the scarlet runner bean is known for its striking red flowers and robust climbing vines. And it's a versatile plant where both the beans and flowers are edible and the flowers add a splash of color and a mild, slightly sweet flavor to various dishes. And the bright red flowers of the scarlet runner bean are edible and can be eaten raw or cooked and they are known for their nectar, which makes them a sweet treat if eaten directly from the plant. And so you can use the scarlet runner beans in several culinary applications from salads to garnishes, which can garnish, um, you can decorate platters with them, or you can brighten up entrees and desserts and the flowers can be used in edible flower arrangements or as a part of a floral garnish for cocktails and drinks. And to preserve them, the flowers can be frozen in ice cubes to create visually stunning additions to drinks. And it's not common to dry the flowers uh, because this will reduce their flavor impact. So it's not really recommended to dry them. And however, you can pickle the flowers in a mild vinegar solution. And this can be an innovative way to preserve their flavor and use them as condiments. So that's kind of interesting. And so some of the recipes I found is a flower salad you mix the scarlet runner bean flowers with salad greens and other edible flowers like nasturtiums or pansies and a sprinkle of nuts and a light vinaigrette. And then um, we have putting, the, well, it says here about stuffing them. Similar to squash blossoms, Scarlet runner bean flowers can be stuffed with soft cheeses or a mixture of rice and herbs and then lightly fried. But I really don't know how that's possible because they're so small. So maybe I'm missing something there, but that's a little bit, uh, you know, maybe it can happen. But the ones I have, maybe because I don't really have, I'm not growing the scarlet runner beans Maybe they have a larger, I've never actually grow, go, grown the scarlet runner bean. So maybe if any of my listeners know, are those flowers big enough to stuff? I'm not sure. And so the scarlet runner beans themselves have different cultivars, cultivars that vary slightly in their flavor of their beans. But the flowers generally have a consistently mild, and slightly sweet flavor across different varieties. And the most noticeable difference is in the aesthetic appeal due to the vibrant red color of the flowers. And so um, some just some notes about this for harvesting. It's important to harvest the flowers judicially, judiciously, <laughs> since over harvesting can reduce the yield of beans. And we all know that if you go out and take off all your flowers, you're, you're not going to have anything, you know, you're not going to have any vegetables come from that. And so that I wanted to know if other runner bean flowers are edible, because I have the black knight growing here and down below me in this garden. And in garden number one, the other garden, I have, um, Pikini Jas, or maybe I'm totally saying that wrong. And I thought it was maybe Johnny Jump Ups. But anyway, they're another kind of runner bean. And so even though I don't think I'll be eating any of these flowers really because it's seed crops, I might try a few. But I wanted to know are, are all runner beans edible? And I found that yes, other varieties of runner beans typically produce edible flowers. And runner beans, including varieties like the white runner bean, painted lady, and pole bean, often have attractive and edible flowers. And these flowers are generally safe to eat and can be used in similar ways 
as the scar scarlet runner bean flowers. And so pretty much it's all exactly the same. Um, it's And it's not as common to pickle other varieties. I mean, if you don't, I think with the scarlet runner beans, it's all about that vibrant, like they're just the vibrancy and how beautiful they are. And so now something that I, I've got, I'm starting to see these guys in my garden. And I saw this on my list and I was like, that's kind of interesting. I, I would have never thought to eat these guys, but it's the lettuce flowers. And so the uh, lettuce is primarily known for its leaves used in salads, but it also produces flowers when it bolts, which is going to seed under stress conditions like high heat. And these flowers are less commonly used in culinary preparations, but they are edible. And lettuce flowers are small yellow. They are small yellow and they grow in clusters <clears throat> and they are edible and have a mild, slightly bitter taste, similar to the leaves, but with a milder intensity. And eating them, it's more about utilizing the whole plant rather than for their flavor. And I guess like if you've got a bunch of, you know, plants that have gone to seed um, or they've bolted and they produce a lot of seed. And so if they're in your garden and you find them and you're like, oh, here it is, you can't eat the lettuce anymore because it's too bitter, but you could eat the flowers. And so lettuce flowers are typically not a primary primary culinary ingredient due to their subtleness and small size, but they can be used as garnishes, as sprinkled over salads or dishes to add color and a hint of bitterness. And lettuce flowers can be part of edible flower gardens, offering both aesthetics and functionality. And so really, it's not common to preserve them. Like, why would you? Uh, but if you really needed to, you could dry them for a very mild flavoring in herbal tea. Although to me, that does not sound appealing. Like, would you like some lettuce tea, lettuce flower tea? I, I don't, I'd pass. Um, some of the recipes I found for them, it's you sprinkling them over salad and dried lettuce flowers can be mixed with other herbs to create a mild, relaxing tea. And I guess that makes sense because they say that lettuce contains the compounds that make you uh, sleepy, like they help you sleep. So yeah, and different varieties of lettuce might produce subtly different flavored flowers, but generally the differences are minimal and that is that. Now the next one I want to talk about is the English daisy. And I'm only thinking about this. We have daisies everywhere here. However, the daisies that are growing everywhere, they are like a weed and they are like the marguerite daisy here. And those are not edible. But the English daisy, commonly known as the common daisy or lawn daisy, features small white flowers with yellow, yellow centers that are both charming and edible, and their mild and somewhat grassy flavor allows them to be a versatile addition to many dishes. And they are edible raw or cooked. They have a, a slightly mild, bitter flavor, and they're most commonly used fresh. And you can put them in salads, and they make pretty edible decorations on cakes, cupcakes, and other desserts. And you can float fresh or frozen daisies in beverages or freezing them into ice cube trays can enhance the visual appeal of spring and summer drinks. And so to preserve English daisy flowers, they can be dried in a dehydrator or air dried in a cool dark place. And once they're dried, store them in an airtight container and use them to make tea or as garnishes. You can freeze them and you can also infuse the flowers in honey, 
vinegar or oil to capture their subtle flavor. And some of the recipes are daisy tea. You want to steep dried or fresh flowers in boiling water to create a mild herbal tea. And daisy infused honey. Fill a jar with fresh daisy flowers. Cover with honey. Seal and let sit for a week or more. Strain before using to sweeten teas or drizzle on desserts. Daisy salad. You want to sprinkle the fresh daisy flowers over a mixed green salad and use a light vinaigrette for a nice springtime dish. And so while English daisies typically feature the classic white petals with a yellow center, there are cultivated varieties with pink or red hues, and the flavor variations among these are subtle, with most retaining a mild, slightly bitter taste that is more about adding visual appeal than significant flavor differences. And uh, yeah, just to reiterate, the marguerite da daisies, they are a different plant than the common English daisy and are not recognized as edible. And they are generally considered ornamental rather than culinary. And uh, it's a funny story. I actually bought a, mar a perennial marguerite daisy and it was on sale, a, a, a garden center sale. And I planted it here and is hilarious because it, it that plant grows like a weed, like it's just, it's everywhere. So, um, but it almost seems like the one I have is a little bit different. It, it must be a little bit slightly different cultivar because it's doing a lot better now and it's actually a lot nicer. And so now the next plant, I, well, the next flower I want to talk about, it's, it's different. It's the milk thistle. And it's primarily known for its, its, its medicinal properties, and it's particularly for supporting liver health. Um, but while the seeds are most commonly used, uh, the flowers, leaves, and roots are also edible. And so milk thistle flowers are edible and have a somewhat sweet, mildly bitter flavor. <clears throat> And just on a side note, the entire plant is edible. The leaves can be despined and used similar to spinach. And the roots can be eaten raw or cooked like a parsnip. And so um, it's the flowers are not commonly used in mainstream cooking, but the flowers can be used as a garnish or steeped to make tea. And you can dry the milk thistle flowers in a dehydrator or air dry in a cool, dark space. And the flowers and seeds can be used to make a tincture, which preserves their med medicinal properties. And so the recipes I found is a milk thistle tea. You dry the flowers and steep them in boiling water to make an herbal tea. And this is often used for its liver supportive properties. And in salads, young tender leaves with the spine removed can be added to salads and the flowers can be used as an edible garnish. And so for the varieties and flavors, there aren't significant flavor variations among different varieties of milk thistle as this plant is not typically bred for culinary use. Um, yeah, and now the next one is, it is a plant I really would like to get, but it's the peony. And peony flowers are renowned for their lush, ornate blooms. And they're not just garden beauties, but they're also edible flowers with a range of uses in culinary and decorative applications. And these flowers um, are primarily cultivated for their aesthetic appeal. And certain parts of some peony species are edible. Um, 
wait, that doesn't, what was I saying? Yeah, certain parts of some peony species are edible. I, oh, I guess that it's talking about the rest of the plant. So for edibility, the peony flowers can be eaten raw or cooked, and they have a slightly sweet and floral taste. And this makes them a delightful addition to various dishes. And it's essential to ensure that the peonies have not been treated with pesticides or chemicals if they are intended for consumption. And so the ways to use them, you can make, you can use them as an edible decoration on cakes, pastries, and desserts uh, for adding color and a touch of elegance. You can use fresh peony petals tossed into green salads for a burst of color and a mild sweet flavor. And they can be frozen in ice cubes to create visually stunning additions to beverages. And to preserve them, you can dry them by spreading the petals on a clean surface and allow them to air dry in a dark, well-ventilated area or use a, a dehydrator. And the dried petals can be used in teas or as garnishes. And you can do crisp or sugar preservation by crystalline, crystallizing peony petals with egg whites and super fine sugar which can create beautiful sweet decorations for desserts and also freezing petals in ice cubes to enhance the visual appeal of drinks. And so some of the recipes I found, there's the peony petal salad and you can mix fresh peony petals into a salad with mixed greens, goat cheese, nuts, and a light vinaigrette uh, you can make peony jelly, cook the peony petals with water, lemon juice, and pectin, then strain and sweeten with sugar to make a floral jelly. And I thought that when you make jelly, you had to have the sugar in with the pectin. So that's, I mean, I, you'd want to be researching and find an exact um recipe, right? And then peony petal sorbet. Blend peony petals with a sugar syrup, lemon juice, and water, then freeze to create a refreshing sorbet. Like how interesting is that? I really, I just wish I had this plant. And so there are many varieties of peonies and the flavor differences between them are generally subtle with most having a mildly sweet taste, and the primary variation lies in their color and size, which can range from deep reds to soft pinks and whites. And it's important to note that only the petals are commonly used. Other parts of the plant, like the leaves and roots, have different uses, uh, particularly in traditional Chinese medicine. And so, yeah, peonies, that's their, that's a unique way to use the flowers there. And this is, this is another out there, like the hodgepodge. I don't know why I chose all this stuff today, but the Oregon grape. And it's a native plant to much of the Pacific Northwest. And it's valued not only for its striking appearance with the holly-like leaves and yellow flowers, but also for its edible fruits. And the flowers themselves are less commonly used in culinary applications compared to the berries, but they can be consumed. And so the bright yellow flowers of the Oregon grape are edible with a tart, somewhat bitter flavor, and they can be used fresh or to garnish salads or desserts and so the berries are more commonly used for their tartness and are rich in vitamin C's, but the flowers can be used as garnishes uh, to add color and tartness to salads and desserts and as tea. The flowers can be dried and mixed with other herbs for flavor and health benefits. And to preserve them, like many other edible flowers, you can dry them in a dehydrator or you can air dry them. 
And you can also infuse them in vinegar or oil to capture their flavor for culinary uses. And so some of the recipes I found, just basic steep dried flowers in boiling water for a unique herbal tea. And then salad with Oregon grape flowers. You can sprinkle the fresh flowers over a green salad. And it has a slight hint of bitterness. And to balance this, you can add a balsamic vinegar dressing. And so that's it. You also, one, of, one important note is like just as any wild plant, when you're harvesting the Oregon grape, ensure that it is done responsibly um, and away from roadside pollution in an area that has not been sprayed. And be sure to correctly identify it uh, as its leaves and berries can some, they can resemble other non-edible species. So that's just a little note there. And now this one, I'm seeing it in my garden and I have, I have it actually in garden number one and I had it, it, I have it up here in garden number two and then I planted like six more of them I'm not sure what I was doing but the really interesting thing is the there's like one of them had the flowers are a different color it's not the same purple like it's a really light it's it's I don't know if anyone knows anything about that but the flowers like it's there's one plant that has different colored flowers, but it's something I need to look into. Um, but anyway, the anise hyssop is a perennial herb from the mint family, and it is prized for its aromatic leaves and attractive flower spikes. And the flowers, as well as the leaves, are edible and have a sweet, mildly licorice-like flavor reminiscent of anise and so the flowers of anise hyssop are edible and can be enjoyed both fresh and dried and they offer a sweet anise like flavor and this makes them a delightful addition to a variety of dishes and so you can use them as garnishes on salads desserts and cocktails both the fresh and dried flowers and leaves can be steeped to make a flavorful herbal tea. And for herbal remedies, they are often used in traditional medicine for digestive problems, colds, and fevers. And the flowers can be used to infuse sugar, syrups, and vinegars. And to preserve them, you want to hang the flower stalks upside down in a cool, dry, dark place or use a dehydrator. You can freeze the flesh, fresh flowers in ice cube trays uh, with water to create attractive ice cubes for drinks. And you can infuse the flowers in honey, vinegar, or oil to capture their flavor for culinary uses. And so some of the recipes I found of course, tea. <laughs> you have an edible flower, you can bet you can put it in a tea. Uh, steep the dried and fresh flowers or fresh flowers in boiling water for a soothing herbal tea. You can also simmer fresh flowers with equal parts of water and sugar until the sugar dissolves, then strain. And you can use this syrup to flavor drinks, lemonades, or desserts. You can sprinkle flesh, fresh flowers over salads for a burst of color and a hint of licorice flavor. Excuse me. And you can also incorporate dried flowers into cookies or muffins for added flavor. And so for the varieties, while there are different varieties, such as Blue Fortune, and golden jubilee, the flavor differences are generally subtle. And most varieties share the characteristic anise-like flavor, but some might have a stronger or milder intensity depending on growing conditions and plant health. And you want to collect the flowers when they are fully open for their best flavor. 
And so the next guy here is I chose him because I just noticed this guy opening his flowers this morning here. And he I have I've left some big some really nice specimens of the this guy growing just because I want them for the seed and for the medicinal value. But it's the the mullein. And I know some people say mullein. I've heard it's you know, pronounced a few different ways. Oh, hold on. Koala, go see if the goats are up here. Uh, one sec. I'm just going to pause this. Please excuse me. I don't know how to pause it. Oh, no. Koala, go see if the goats are here. I'm sorry. I am on a new... Um, I, I just... I don't see how I can pause it. Oh, no. Okay. Um, we're going to leave it here. I'm a little over time. I will, I hope everyone is doing well and I will see you in a few days. Maybe I will even see you in the garden. Thank you for joining me for this episode of In the Garden with Susan. I hope you're enjoying the Flower Power series and as we look at all the different edible flowers, you can find this podcast and others at Spotify, Podchaser, Radio Public. It's on my Rumble channel. It's on my YouTube channel. And you can always find it at my website at www dot garden fairy botanicals dot ca i look forward to chatting with you next week when we will continue on our journey through the edible flowers